Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, The Magic of Mushrooms. Thank you all for joining us. I know uh, it's a beautiful day. There's certainly a lot to be uh, done outside on a, on a nice day like today, but thank you for joining us for this indoor webinar on The Magic of Mushrooms. I am James Stevenson, and I am with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences here in Pinellas County. We are a partnership between the University of Florida and our local government, and we provide free information to our citizens on subjects um, to help improve uh, everyone's quality of life without uh, having a negative impact on things like the environment. So I'm lucky enough to come to you from Brooker Creek Preserve here in the north of the county, uh, where we provide environmental education. And we do things like we uh, bring appreciation to the natural world. So thank you for appreciating the natural world and joining us today. If you do have any questions, comments, or complaints uh, throughout today's presentations, please don't hesitate to use the Q and A, the question and answer function. I will do my very best to monitor the Q and A throughout today's presentation and read the questions as I answer them as we go along. Uh, there is also a chat feature, but we would like to steer you, if you wouldn't mind, towards the Q and A uh, version of the communication um, opportunities. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and it is also being live streamed on Facebook. Greetings to all our Facebook friends. Again, I am James Stevenson with the University of Florida IFAS Extension and I am a fungophile. I am not a fungophobe. Uh, here's a picture we're going to explain a little bit later of myself taking a picture of a risky fungus and getting kind of questionably close to that particular specimen. So in today's presentation, The Magic of Mushrooms, what we're going to do is take a peek at the world of mushrooms. And what we are not going to do is spend this 45 minutes together merely talking about mushrooms as food mushrooms can be food i have nothing against eating mushrooms and there's certainly a lot to be said about mushrooms as food but that's not today we got a lot more to talk about nor are we going to spend an inordinate amount of time talking about how dangerous mushrooms can be there are a lot more than food there are a lot more than danger and if you wouldn't mind let's not dwell on the trippy side of things. You mentioned mushrooms. I mentioned mushrooms. It's like people automatically go to psychedelics. It's fascinating. It's wonderful. It's certainly worthy of volumes of work, but not today. We're going to look at everything else because there's plenty covered on those other three areas. So eating, no, not today. Um, Dying from eating, not today, and tripping, not today. Let's just leave those three elements to the side. Let's not completely eliminate those elements, but we'll leave them to the side for now. Let's concentrate on just looking at mushrooms, inspecting, observing, understanding, and appreciating these odd structures that seem to appear magically from nowhere overnight okay does that suit does that suit us gathered here this afternoon i certainly hope so and let's carry on so mushrooms cool mushrooms are cool talk about mushrooms they're everywhere in popular culture right the mushroom the mushroom as a cartoon character the mushroom as a um, popular video game component. Uh, the mushroom image pops up throughout popular culture in various shapes, sizes, permutations. Uh, we're probably all, 
I, I hazard to aver that we are all familiar with the culinary button mushroom. The button mushroom, the um, cremini, portobello, they're all the same thing. This, this, this culinary mushroom, we've all had one in our hands, if not in our mouth. We get what the mushroom is like. The mushrooms also popped up throughout literary history. Uh, even the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland had something to say about mushrooms. And of course, Alice herself uh, prevailed upon the mushroom to change her size, or at least her own personal perception of her size as she made her way through Wonderland. So in that popular story, mushrooms are wrapped up in the mythology of both Eastern and Western cultures, often associated with, of course, woodlands and woodland lore, woodland superstition. Um, and certainly with the occult, mushrooms being these mysterious objects, lending themselves perfectly to aligning with the occult. Uh, a, a discipline which also concerns at times itself with mysticism, otherworldliness, supernatural occurrences, um, and so on. So mushrooms being oftentimes an object of the night and of mystery and of potential danger of mistaken identity and all these things, it helps inform the mystique that surrounds these structures known as mushrooms. I even managed to find, I didn't, I wasn't look, okay, I was looking, I wasn't looking for something to wear, but I was looking for mushrooms in popular culture. And I found this cute ensemble. Um, with mushrooms, which might be perfect to wear to heaven knows where. But anyway, you get it. Mushrooms everywhere, definitely part of our natural history and our popular culture. So let us today, you and I, let us explore these things, these mushrooms, these structures that suggest all of these wonderful esoteric concepts in our modern society. Some quick fun facts about mushrooms. The oldest and largest living organism, forget your giant redwood, please. I mean, don't forget, but put aside the giant redwood, put aside the, the massive uh, blue whale, and spare a thought for the world's largest organism and oldest, a mushroom. A single mushroom, which covers three and a half square miles. Uh, it's estimated to be about 2,400 years old in Oregon. Uh, one single organism taking up this entire space. Now, this isn't a single mushroom that takes up three square miles. And what, we'll, what we will learn about mushrooms is that they are merely the above ground representation of an organism that spends most, if not all of its life hidden from view. The largest and oldest is a mushroom. Another fun fact about mushrooms they are the outward appearance of this underground fungus, and the fungus is responsible for the literal tying together of entire ecosystems. In a structure which has been dubbed the wood wide web, throughout woodland ecosystems and very likely other ecosystems as well, but definitely within woodland ecosystems, every single plant, 
is very likely united by a series of fungal networks that allows the individual members of that woodland ecosystem to communicate with one another. It's pretty good stuff. Another fun fact is that some mushrooms can glow intentionally, can produce light, and living organisms that produce light are called bioluminescent organisms. Um, like this Asian species of mushroom, which glows in the dark in an attempt to attract insects. The way that flowers attract insects to facilitate pollination, these glowing mushrooms actually attract insects like beetles who think whatever thoughts beetles have when they are drawn to light. But in being drawn to this light, the beetles in turn get covered in the fungal spores and help move the spores away from the parent plant. Pretty clever cooperative evolution. Another fun fact about mushrooms, you know, uh, Oatsy, the ice man that was discovered uh, late in the last century, um, defrosted, de thawed out uh, from a deep freeze high in the mountains, completely intact with all of the gear that Otzi was carrying when he perished. Among Otzi's possessions were two species of fungus, one of which is was used uh, has been proven to have been used historically in the starting of fire as a basically a Bic lighter. Humans had incorporated this odd woodland denizen and somehow discovered that this Piptopterus fungus could be used as a fire starter. So you carry this with you and Otzi did so that fire could be established upon camping. Another species has since been proven ethnobotanically to have been used historically to treat various ailments, aches and pains. And so a medicinal fungus was on Otzi's person. And remember, Otzi was on foot, so anything carried would have to be extremely valuable and worth the real estate given to carrying that. So this Iceman, as it were, carried with him some very valuable to him fungus as he made his fateful trip through the mountains. So fungus, we're talking about mushrooms. We know we're talking about mushrooms. We must and definitely are talking about fungus. So fungus, so what's that? Let's put fungus and the kingdom fungi in perspective briefly and first. When thinking about life on earth and we have this beautiful big blue marble, this biosphere, that encrusts the surface of our planet. Life has found itself into some relatively discreet packages. And we have one sphere of life known as the bacteria. These need no introduction. We've all heard of bacteria. We might remember that the bacteria are single-celled organisms, very quote-unquote basic in their structure, although there are certainly species capable of some quite um, extraordinary uh, capabilities. But at the basic level, bacteria, no nucleus, just a thing reproducing by splitting in half, 
spreading, growing, evolving, interacting with the environment and with other organisms in their own way, the bacteria. That's one sphere of life on Earth. Another sphere of life on Earth is almost like a progression in, in sophistication, as it were, or in complexity of body form. And we have those cells that have a nucleus that kind of have a, an act, not necessarily together, but they have an act. Um, they have direction. Um, they are single-celled organisms referred to as the protists. So think amoeba, you know, still kind of basic, but getting there. So we have the sphere of life that is the bacteria, the sphere of life that is the protists. Of course, we have the sphere of life that are the plants with all their characteristics that make plants plants. They're green, they make their own food. That's the producers of the planet are primarily the plants who can take sunlight and water and turn them into carbon carbohydrates that everything else in the world, bacteria, protists, animals, and we shall see others can eat. Speaking of animals, that's another sphere of life on Earth. We all know what animals are, everything from jellyfish to you and I. And the final, the last sphere of life that we will consider, separate from all these others, are the fungi. Bacteria, protists, plants, animals, and fungi, each with their own way of making it through the world. Fungi are very often associated with, considered with, classified with, and studied by those who concern themselves with the plant world. But they're not plants, separate from plants in the scheme of the spheres of life. Not only that, but evolutionarily speaking, the fungus and the animals are basically branches of the same tree of life. Whereas the plants are way over there on their, on their own bough of the tree of life. So fungus has been studied with the plants primarily because many fungus come out of the ground, many fungus live in the ground as plants do. Many fungus grow up and spread out like plants do, but they're not plants. They're not even closely related to plants. Fungus are much more closely related to you and I. As eaters of the world, the plants are the producers, the animals and the fungi are the eaters. The bacteria, the protists, they tend to be the decayers, but the fungus belong to this kingdom of saprotrophic, which means they eat rot or, and or parasitic, but they eat, they take from their host that they parasitize. They reproduce by special cells called spores. And fungus lives as a filamentous organism. Fungus lives as a filamentous organism. Picture filaments, picture threads, picture a filigree of threads, a filamentous organism. Imagine that. And this includes the fungus writ large, mold, rust, mildew, smut, mushroom, yeast. Um, you get the idea. Penicillin, world famous, kind of celebrity fungus, bread mold, and so on. Lots to study about fungus in and of itself. But today, mushrooms. But wait, what's this about fungus being filamentous? Mushrooms don't appear to be filamentous. Let's take a look at that. 
this is a fungus. This is what fungus looks like when fungus is actively growing and eating the products of the producers, the plants. When fungus is living and growing and, and um, carrying out its, its life history on earth, it is growing as this filamentous organism. That's what it looks like. Not much, usually hidden from view. Fungus was the first multicellular organism on land. Fungus did this. It branched and grew and spread through the very, very young surface of the earth and had an uncharted territory all to itself. There was no soil, there was no organics on the surface, but slowly as fungus grew, perhaps digesting the washed up masses of the aquatic bacteria and breaking them down into their components and eating them, this helped establish the conditions that then allowed other organisms to come up out of the water and take on life on earth. The filaments that the filamentous organisms known as the fungi are made of, are those filaments themselves are referred to as the hypha. The hypha look multicellular, branching, hollow tubes branching this is a bad drawing but i think if you kind of cross this image zoom in to this image do you kind of get what i'm trying to draw here these hollow filamentous tubes with nuclei very often occasional septa or compartmentalization little walls in between the sections of the different hyphal filaments and these will just continue to grow and branch and spread almost infinitely. The way that fungus or fungi eat, the way that fungi derive their nutrition is most often saprotrophic, which means these filaments secrete enzymes, you've heard of enzymes, secrete enzymes into their environment where they are growing. And those enzymes then break the environment, whatever it is, into simpler components, very deconstructive, disassemblative, reductionist. And then after the environment, the, com the components of the environment have been broken into simpler parts, those simpler parts are then absorbed by those same filaments and reassembled within those filaments to serve the fungal, the fungal needs. So we dissolve our environment, reabsorb the parts that we can use, use those parts to our advantage, we in the form of fungus, and continue to grow, increase in space and size and ad, finite, ad infinitum. The, the humongous fungus that we looked at before in Oregon, we get to be 2,400 years old. This is how a majority of fungus make their living. And all the mushrooms result from these 
hyphal networks. The hyphae, plural, these filaments, colorless, often transparent, you know, one cell thick, incredibly small, vanishingly small, very, very uh, fragile, thus living inside of whatever structure this hyphal network is going to be digesting or decomposing out of the rays of the sun, doesn't need the sun like plants do, living oftentimes underground inside of wood structures as agents of rot and decomposition, out of the sun, out of the drying winds, but ever so effective at moving through the environment and dissolving it as it goes. So once a mass of hyphae has reached a critical point and the organism to which that hyphae belongs can be identified, that mass is then referred to as the mycelium of that species. So the growing structure composed of hyphae of a particular species of mushroom is referred to the mycelium. So usually what you can see is the mycelium. You lift up a rotten log, you see this network of very, it looks like mold. This is the mycelium. So this is the active feeding, living, growing, the most, um, this is the realm that the fungus spends the majority of its time in as this feeding stage, the mycelium. Does that make sense? I know I'm throwing a lot of words in that seem to overlap. So the mycelium is made of hyphal strands. The mycelium is made of little hyphae together that feeding structure, that collection of hyphae is referred to as the mycelium of that species. The mycelium being so small and so thin walled and occupying the soil, fast forward a billion years or so, a lot of other life has made its way onto land Fungus was already there, it's adapting. Now it's got soil and it's got trees that it's decomposing. It's got bark, it's got leaves, it's got ferns, it's got all this wonderful carbohydrates that the plants are making. Great, I can break that down myself. I can use the carbon, I can use the nitrogen and so on. So these hyphal strands eventually found a way to incorporate themselves into the tissues of plants. Remember, they're not plants. They're not even closely related to plants. But here we are living in the soil together and the fungus being made of these tiny little, you know, microscopic tubules, so are the plant roots. Having such similarities, fungus found its way in to plant tissues and found a way to derive nutrient directly from those plants and still wait, instead of waiting for the plant to die and breaking down the tissues, how about just plumb ourselves right in there as fungus? So I seem to be speaking quite a lot as, fun, as, of, as fungus today. So here we have the fungus plumbing itself into the actual plant itself. Is it a parasitic? Is it parasitic? It would be if the host, in this case, the plant, were losing, were only losing nutrition or resources to the fungus, but in turn, the fungus provides a conduit for nutrition from perhaps another plant that this fungus is also associated with. So perhaps the plant that in this picture has these cells, these root cells, 
on the top of the picture, perhaps this individual plant is lacking in a nutrient. The fungus could pick up on that information and derive that missing nutrient from another plant in the forest and bring it through this mycelial hyphal network and provide it to this host. So there's give and there's take, making this not a parasitic, but more of a mutualistic arrangement. We do have an entire hour on that one subject. So enough about that for today, the wood wide web. How fungi unite ecosystems. Get to the mushrooms. I'm here for the mushrooms. So back to our mycelium. Eventually, these hollow tubes of hyphae, the mycelium of a species, has spread through the medium, has dissolved and absorbed lots and lots of good nutrition. At some point, based on some information given to the mycelium, that mycelium begins to knit together, to wind together. The filamentous organ, organism known as the fungus, twists, knits, and ties those filaments together into, he finally got there half an hour later, mushrooms. So mushrooms that we know of, that we've had on our plate and that perhaps we've used our hands to break apart. If you look very closely, you will see that the body of a mushroom is made of these filaments knitted together. It's basically a wad of above ground mycelium. Only 10% of the known fungal species produce mushrooms. It's not ubiquitous. Not all mushrooms, not all fungus makes mushrooms. All mushrooms are fungus, but not all fungus make mushrooms. It's just one mechanism that's employed by a small minority of fungal species throughout fungal diversity in the world. Other species make other structures. Here's the turkey tail, quite ubiquitous in Eastern forests growing on dead wood. Would you call that a mushroom? I mean, you'd probably call it a fungus, but it doesn't really fit the description of the mushroom uh, that you would mentally refer to. There are bracket fungus like Oatsy had in his backpack, uh, like this Ganoderma species. Uh, you would call that a fungus, but maybe not a mushroom. But why are these structures created? There's a part of the fungus life cycle that we've kind of omitted. We talked about their nutrition, but what's the other, what's the only reason for life to even exist what is that reason? It is, of course, reproduction. And fungus reproduce by, we said it before, fungus reproduce by spores. Spores are specialized cells, individual cells, that are released into the environment, germinate and grow into the next generation. And this is where our mushrooms come in to play. It is the mushroom that facilitates the distribution of spores. Spores are then released into the above ground environment where wind and gravity and even electromagnetism, static electricity, can move these special cells away from the parent and hopefully far, far away 
to germinate and grow into initially hyphae. And once a critical mass of hyphae is amassed, it becomes that mycelial mass that becomes the adult living, growing, feeding, and eventually maturing and reproducing fungal species. Remember, all that mycelium knits itself up and produces the fruiting body, which is an unfortunate name that has been applied by, at first it was the botanists that were given fungus to study because, because of them coming out of the ground. Fruiting bodies was the term that was used to describe the above ground structures that produce the spores for reproduction. And so ask a mycologist, someone who studies fungus, a mycologist, the technical name for a mushroom is a fruiting body. I'm sorry, it's not my fault. That's just what it is. The fruiting body. Fruiting because it grows from an adult and produces the propagules. So here we have the fruiting bodies of this oyster mushroom issuing forth to release the spores into the an environment. A mushroom then has been compared to the mushroom, this, has been compared to an apple. And an apple is the reproductive structure, or the apple is involved in the reproduction of the apple tree. Within the apple are the seeds. The tree produces the apple. The intention is for the apple to be removed from the tree containing the seeds, and that should be carried away from the parent plant and deposit the seeds deposited somewhere else for growth to take place. So the mushroom has been compared to, but is not analogous to the apple on a tree. You can pick a mushroom and do zero, almost zero to the adult mycelial mass that is living in the environment that it's digesting. So the mushroom is not the thing. The fungus is living its life out of sight and the mushroom is just the, the reproductive structure that is put into the atmosphere to send spores into the world. Technically speaking, the mushroom is made of these parts. The cap, making sense, being called a cap. The gills, which you might recognize as the, you know, surface area, little folds underneath the cap, the gills and the stalk of the mushroom. Now, of course, being scientist, can't stick with just one name, the cap, also known as the pileus, the gills, also known as the lamellae, and the stalk, for some reason, has to have another name, the stipe. There is also some ornamentation on many mushrooms' stalk called the annulus, it is a ring of tissue that very often represents where the cap was once connected to the stalk as it was pushing through the ground. And then when the cap separated from the stalk, this annular ring was left behind. The reason that all these things, well, the benefit of each of these parts having names is that when we, should you decide to pursue mushroom identification, the
the cap, the gills, the stalk, and the annular ring are components of different species of mushrooms that will have distinguishing characteristics that can be used in identification. The cap can be a parasol type covered in scales or simply the artifacts in the growth and expansion of a particular species. This lepiota mushroom, like the one back here, very common in lawns with those brown scaly patches, very diagnostic for the identification of this particular species. You can even perhaps see in this magnified view that the mushroom structure itself is made of those filaments. Remember that fungus is a filamentous organism. And you can see those filaments expressed in the cap of this reproductive structure. In the fly agaric, the cap can not only have the ornamentation of the, um, the maturation of the, of the cap, but the cap itself could turn a diagnostic color. The fly agaric, one of the Amanita mushrooms, found throughout the Northern Hemisphere and is the red and white mushroom that gets put on most whatever, lunch boxes, umbrellas, video games, all these things. The red and white, the, the very, very widely known Amanita muscaria. The cap of a mushroom could be very elongated. Not all mushrooms are parasol shaped. These are in fact quite elongated. And the cap of this mushroom belongs to the inky cap. What's interesting about this particular species or this genus of fungus is that after this reproductive structure, the sporocarp comes out of the ground overnight very rapidly and opens and releases the spores, the cap then begins to auto-digest itself and to turn itself back into a liquid and those nutrients can then be reabsorbed. It's quite cunning. Waste not, want not. Don't leave anything to chance. Dissolve upon presentation to the environment. This is one of our autumn favorites here in the wooded swamp of Brooker Creek. We like to find the violet court. The cap of the violet court is a pretty purple, and it is also very, very shiny and wet and slippery. That's a diagnostic for this particular genus. Collecting all the information, the size, the height, the time of year, the condition of the cap, the color of the cap, um, all of these distinguishing characteristics can help should one decide to pursue mushroom identification. First comes appreciation, second comes observation, and then we start to move into really, really digging into the terminology and the characteristics that help us identify mushrooms. Another one of our favorite autumn fruiting, quote unquote, species is this fragile dapperling. The cap of this species is incredibly diaphanous. It is not many cell layers thick itself. So again, its job is to present the spore producing structures to the environment so that the spores, the reproductive cells of this fungus can get put into the environment, into the atmosphere and sent far away, 
hopefully to find untapped resources that that species could then colonize an area further away from the parent plant. I'm going to take a drink of water, open up the Q&A. I think I see so we have some questions in here before we move on to the next section, the gills. And we'll, I think I'll move from the, oh, I'll move from the top to the bottom. Um, do fungus, okay, how, I think Danielle was asking about the, um, the bioluminescent fungus. How do they harvest the light? Or is it a chemical reaction like a lightning bug? It's the latter. The fungus is able to chemically synthesize light producing chemicals. So it is a, it is just like the lightning bug, same kind of pathway to produce that glow. Where can bioluminescent mushrooms be found? They're not uncommon in tropical areas. Maybe South Florida, certainly Southeast Asia, South America, but in, for some reason, in warmer, more tropical areas. The thought behind the distribution of bioluminescent fungus in tropical areas is that when wind, when breeze is at a minimum, the chances of spores traveling a great distance from the parent are diminished. So putting the spores in or on an insect like a beetle that's attracted to that bioluminescence, that beetle can then get further than a little puff of wind that you would find in, in a tropical jungle. Just think of Florida in September at 11 o'clock at night and there's not a breath of wind. If you were producing spores, they would fall at your feet and then you would have all your kids right there and they would all want your resources. Mm, nobody wants that. So the fungus bioluminesces, attracts the insects that can then take the, not the pollen, what am I trying to say? The spores, way, way, way over there. <gasps> which photo is which on Otzi? The photo to the left was the species on the top. The photo to the right was the species just below. Two conks. Can mushrooms go extinct if there are species at risk and why? Yes, indeed, mushrooms can go extinct. If only we had a better understanding catalog of the species that we currently today haven't eliminated from the environment with data on population strength, that would certainly help our knowledge and focus our concern on areas of conservation. Because fungus is so critical to ecosystems, losing the fungus could lose that ecosystem. The whole idea, the concept of the wood wide web underscores this, how everything is tied together thanks to the presence of the fungus. Certain invasive species when they form a monoculture can and have been shown to disrupt the fungal communities in the soil in the areas that they have disrupted monocultures of brazilian pepper for example have been shown to alter the soil chemistry that does not favor those species of fungus that were traditionally present that other species may depend on making that soil less likely to support the vegetation that had been there prior to the arrival of the brazilian pepper and our okay good question are ferns with spores a type of fungus that's a very good question. Ferns are a plant. Ferns are a true blue dyed in the wool plant. The word spore applies to both organisms, even though they were 
independently derived structures. There wasn't an ancestor that made spores that became the ferns and the mushrooms, generally speaking. Both of these modern groups of life on Earth, the, the ferns, the fungus, utilize single cells in their reproductive strategies. I hope that makes sense that the single cell that is the spore of a fern is a reproductive strategy that ferns still use to this day. Fungus also reproduces using a special cell. Both of those get to be called spores because they're weird single cells, but they belong and have been derived by two very separate groups of organisms. I hope that answers that question. So we took a look at some of the interesting caps of the fungus or pilea of the fungus. Let's flip the cap and take a look underneath at the gills. And it's the gills where the spores are actually produced all along the surface of the gill structures. And the gills are very, very thin and membranous in order to create an extremely high surface area to volume ratio. If you, I'm really bad at these kind of numbers things, but if you take a look at the gills on this portabella, if you were to lift each gill out and lay this out, facing up, you would have quite a lot of square inches of portabella gill surface. And then double that because each side of one of those gills that you take out and put on the table, each side is going to have spore producing tissue. So just that is the whole idea, the surface area to volume ratio. It's the radiator fins on your car. It's the, um, the fins on the compressor of your, of your air conditioning. Those are all increasing the surface area so that, you know, air can circulate the most and get over the most surface area. I hope that makes sense. Surface area to volume ratio. Lots of surface area packed on the gills of this portobello mushroom. The oyster mushrooms, you can see have gills that extend not only underneath the cap, which is typical of most mushrooms, but all the way down the stipe as well. That kind of presentation of the gills could be very diagnostic in determining the identity of this particular species. And it would be a good thing to identify the Pleurotus genus because they are very, very sought after as a culinary delight, the oyster mushrooms. It's not just the presentation of the gills from the cap down the stipe, but that characteristic paired, matched with some others, help getting towards a proper identification of that genus or even that species. Some gills have particular shapes you can see the shape of the gills on this species are curved and they kind of move up towards the center of the cap. This diagnostic shape could be unique to this particular genus of mushroom. A good look at a fresh mushroom with incomplete gills so the gills don't necessarily stretch in all cases from the edge of the cap all the way to the stalk. Again, diagnostic characteristics. So here is a microscopic view of a cross section of those gills themselves. So here we have the edge of the cap and then a microscopic look at the surface 
of the gills. And on either side, these dark lines represent the spore producing tissues. So all along this dark blue line, there are little structures making spores, giving you an idea, hopefully, intentionally, the intention is for you to get the idea of the tremendous number of spores that are produced by a single mushroom. All along that dark line are these little structures called basidia, which means little bat, these little club-like structures with the horns on the top. And at the tip of each one of those horns, a single spore. So do your math between this, all these dark lines being the basidia lined up, each basidia producing up to four spores, those gills being reproduced with an incredible surface area to volume ratio, and individual mycelia underground popping 20, 50, 100 individual mushrooms up, each one producing millions and millions of spores. There is a economy of scale that is quite great in this group of fungus. And those fungus that produce the basidia along their gills are botan or not botanically, but mycologically referred to as the basidiomycetes. And a majority of mushrooms that we are familiar with are this type. They reproduce that way. Most of the basidiomycetes that produce mushrooms are the ones referred to as the agaric mushrooms the most familiar of them, the fly agaric, again, being the ultimate cartoon mushroom, right? The red and white. Hallucinogenic mushroom. Also toxic, potentially fatal, not one to mess with. And the fly agaric, is one species that humans have wrapped our cultural heritage with. And in some places, this Northern Hemisphere denizen is associated with magic in some human societies this species is associated with death in some societies this species is associated with tripping for whatever reason so in each corner of northern hemisphere human population and association with mushrooms seems to have gone one of two ways one of reverence and one of fear the scotch irish english former majority north american population comes from a collective background where the mushrooms are a little more feared than revered. Fungophobic society where, again, you ask 10 people about mushrooms, one of the first three things that a majority of them, let's say 70, seven of them, seven of the 10, are going to bring up poisonous, trippy, or, you know, edible, but potentially deadly. So this kind of fungi, be careful, be very, very careful. I've heard that mushrooms can kill you. And as soon as you eat it, 
you're dead, even though it takes you four weeks to die and you can't get treated and you're just going to sit there and die for four weeks. All the, all the lore that's wrapped up around that. The fungophilic human societies, such as the further east you go, the more fungophilic people seem to, humans seem to get, were and have been traditionally much more likely to have revered as food and as medicine. Not quite as much of the fear and loathing. And a lot of it has to do with this ubiquitous fly agaric. Another group of the Basidiomycetes, to, to throw that sci name back in there for just a second, are the mushrooms with no gills. And these are not hard to find in central Florida forests. The boletes. These are very chunky mushrooms. The stalk is very thick. The cap is very thick. The absence of gills means that the cap itself is pretty solid. But for the presentation of millions of little holes in that solid cap tissue. And it is the lining of these pores where the basidia are located. So the basidia are more tube, are, are presented more on tubular structures that stretch from the opening to the environment all the way through the solid cap as these tubular structures that eventually empty to the external air currents, static currents, and so forth. Those are the boletes. Easy to find, easy to identify, and there hasn't yet been a bolete that has caused a fatal outcome to a human ingesting a bolete. There has yet to be a bolete fatality. So we are very, very close to saying there aren't any deadly toxic boletes. Wouldn't that be fun? The stinkhorns, another group of basidiomycetes that kind of turn the whole spore distribution mechanism on its head. Instead of dropping spores into the environment and hoping that it catches magnetic waves or wind drafts, the stinkhorn and its relatives produce the basidia on the surface along with a sticky substance. And so all this goes on on the surface of the cap, not underneath in gills, but on the surface. This is phallus impudicus. And again, this thing appearing overnight in your garden could certainly have given early humans a little pause. Something magic and kind of weird is going on. These do live up to their names, the stink horns. That sticky mass of spores and um, viscous liquid called gleba stinks of rot or feces or dung, but it stinks. And it attracts the filth feeding flies, thinking, mmm, rot, mmm, dung. Mmm, feces. So here he goes, going in for a snack of gross, ending up with the spores all over the, all six hands and mouth and face and eyes and everything else, getting covered in the spores. And like our tropical species, moving those spores far away without having to, um, without having to depend on the breeze getting some other vector involved. So this is a highly adapted species because of course there were no insects when the first mushrooms, when the first fungus came on land, there wasn't anything. 
And this, the latticed, one of the latticed stinkhorns, these are pretty ubiquitous in mulch. This species, this clathrus or this genus gets moved around quite a lot. It's mycelia forms breaking down uh, tree lignans, tree cellulose in the form of bark. That bark gets processed into mulch. The mycelia just gets broken up into little bits that continue to live. That doesn't bother them. They're not, a, there's no central structure of fungal mycelia. You can break it in half and you've now got two. You can run it through a mulch shredder and then you've got millions. This then gets transported throughout. Irrigation breaks the wood down even further, helps the clathrus along, and suddenly you've got this beautiful thing popping up out of your garden, out of your very well manicured Florida friendly yard. Also, one of the stinkhorn group, although these are more like stink baskets, um, with a three dimensional surface where the flies can go inside, get covered in that gleba leaf, and disperse the spores. What you can see in this photograph is that this fungus, like many, has popped through what looks upon emergence very much like an egg. It's called the vulva, V-O-L-V-A, and it's just a protective layer that can open and allow the fruiting body to protrude through. The Amanita, the fly agaric, also issues forth from a very visible egg shaped and egg colored vulva. Sometimes it's persistent, that structure, and can help in identification. Getting a little bit technical again, the other spore producing structure beside the basidia, which is the little bat with the four spores on top, there is another group of fungus that instead of forming basidia, they form bags of spores called ASCII. And each little sac or ascus contains eight spores. And it's just a very natural split in two major groups of fungus. The basidiomycetes that have the basidia on their gills and the ascomycetes that instead of producing basidia, they produce these little bags called ASCII with eight spores inside. The ascomycetes usually produce cup-shaped sporocarps. So their fruiting body, after all the mycelium has gone, I mean, there's still a fungus, there's still a filamentous organism called a fungus made of, you know, chitin proteins. But when it comes to making a fruiting body, very often the ascomycetes produce cup-shaped structures. It's just their gig. It's just their jive. It's just what they've sorted out. They had a common ancestor that did it, and all the offspring that make the ASCII, make the cups, it's just how they live. But they're, and they are often associated in lichen associations, the ascomycete type fungus. More on that. Take a trip over to our YouTube channel, learn more about the life of lichen there and the ascomycete fungus. But as far as mushrooms go, not many ascomycetic mushrooms. The majority are basidiomycetes, but there's this one called the morel or the morel, morcella. And this is a very sought after prize wild mushroom that has yet to be brought into successful commercial 
scale cultivation. This produces a fruiting body, which looks enough like a mushroom that the lay person, which you are not now, by the way, you've now been educated, whether you like it or not, you know a lot more than you did, I hope, when we started, you would recognize this thing as the fruiting body of some kind of fungus. This one is an ascomycete. So if it matters to you on the surface of the cap, there are little bags with eight spores inside and it's producing them by the billion. This one is very widely harvested, especially pronounced after an, a natural forest fire seems to stimulate the um, initiation of the fruiting bodies of the various Morcella species. I want to mention one more thing when it comes to the stimulation of the initiation of the fruiting bodies. What is it that signals to the mycelial mass that the conditions are right for the initiation of the production of this reproductive structure? Because no living organism can exist today, except for us, that wastes time and resources. Wasting time and resources would have selected us out if we were any other organism. We have learned how to waste time and resources. Those organisms that have had to make a living on their own through the production of carbohydrates like the plants or the decomposition of things like the mushrooms, they have to conserve their resources and use them wisely. So what signals mycelium time to go, time to reproduce? Well, in the case of the morels, it has been shown that fire, the sudden influx of the chemicals that are associated with the conversion of plant matter to its reduced state by the activity of fire, that balance of chemistry being thrown into the certain direction stimulates the initiation of the reproduction of this particular genus. An old Japanese folk lore tied a link between lightning and mushroom appearance. And the most, among the most cringe worthy of expressions, old wives tale, that lightning was somehow associated with mushroom initiation. It's true. The old wives had it right. It's the old wives that were the most observant. And studies have now shown that the fixing of nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen, by the activity of lightning in a particular area can be the stimulus necessary to initiate the production of the sporocarps, of the fruiting bodies, to make mushrooms happen so what all of this you've spent an hour and 13 minutes i'm losing my voice who cares well the beetles do the pleasing fungus beetles they couldn't live without this ganoderma fungus initiating itself without this ganoderma fungus knitting all of its mycelium together to try and reproduce and bursting up out of the wood that it has inhabited, very likely from the tree that it has intentionally killed. Yes, some, some fungus are fatal, not even, not only to people, but intentionally killing their host. You know, the, the humongous fungus in Oregon, it's killing that forest that it lives in on purpose because it wants to feed on the dead wood. How can it be 2,400 years old? Well, the trees are fighting back. So the pleasing fungus beetles care. They're feeding on 
the emerging bodies of this fungus. Another animal on the other end of the spectrum, the squirrel cares. The squirrel is helping disperse the species by carefully eating those bits of this particular species. I believe it's a Russell, a Russell. Some of the mushrooms are Russells, Russellia, or Russelia, whichever, however you want to say. It. Anyway, this squirrel is eating a Russell, but being very careful not to eat the parts that either through experimentation or trial and error or uh, some sort of instinctual knowledge, the squirrel's going to spit out the majority of this mushroom because certain parts of this mushroom are not palatable to this particular mammal. This particular mammal doesn't have what it takes to properly process certain of the chemicals associated with this. So it's going to get the nutrition it needs and leave the rest. So do y'all remember the last great extinction event? I feel like I was there when the meteor came, you know, and wiped out all the dinosaurs. And we had the, the nuclear night for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Those species that were left on Earth following the big extinction event in the dark. Plants can't photosynthesize very efficiently. Most plants died out. There was our fungus, not needing sunlight, only needing things to decompose, things to deconstruct. There was plenty of stuff to deconstruct after the meteor impact. There sure were. And those species, let's say the plants that had plumbed in there, plumbed themselves into the fungal species, they were able to kind of limp along through the nuclear winter. So it certainly behooves us in a very fatalistic way of looking at our future. It behooves us to associate ourselves perhaps even more with these ultimate pioneers and ultimate survivors, the fungi. But there's so much more to learn. I couldn't resist. Um, and I now would like to learn from you. I have a poll to launch. I have a drink of water to get. So the quicker that y'all answer your poll question, launch, if you wouldn't mind just quickly running through these questions, just point and click your answer. And then I'll close it once most of y'all have answered, if not all of you. We've got about 20 people left in the room. I really, stop, I'm drinking. I appreciate your attention this afternoon. Um, what was the stinkhorn I was photographing? I think we got that one done. That one's done. That is done. Is to ask, is it a mushroom? Yes, that um, we do have a question about. Okay, we're going to end the poll. Thank you very much for your answers. For responding to that, we had a question about the dog vomit fungus. Um, dog vomit. Slime mold, that's a subject for another presentation. It's not fungus, sadly. I mean, not sadly, but just interestingly. The slime molds were given 
to the mycologist because they're weird and they don't fit into any other category. So they must be fungus. Turns out the dog vomit or the slime molds are actually protists, giant protists, gigantic in the scheme of things, like giant yellow amoeba. So they belong to a different kingdom. They don't belong to our fungal kingdom. All right, thanks for spending your afternoon again. Um, please do contact if you have any questions, comments, complaints, concerns, suggestions, anything that we can do to help improve. We're always looking for that. Do email me jstevenson at pinellascounty.org. And I'm going to now uh, give you a list of the sources, some of the sources for today's presentation. Sign off and wish you all a happy April.